I think it's appropriate at this stage I should declare that I am a fairly long-standing member of the British Horse Society and uh, we have a point to point which we intend to hold on Easter Saturday at Kimball. So uh, I uh, uh, am very much involved in the interests of the world we're going to be talking about. Indeed, this is my uh, fourth um, attendance as the Minister responsible for Rural Affairs, Biosecurity and Animal Health. And I'm delighted to attend because I think this is a seminal event and for many years I attended as a participant uh, in the auditorium. But my thanks go and I recognise how much work goes on, mostly by volunteers involved in ensuring smooth running and of course Georgina Crossman and by your combined efforts under the very able leadership of Tim Brigstock, I believe the National Equine Forum maintains its prowess as an essential event in the equine calendar. Uh, as a member of the government, uh, I can say that we are extremely grateful for the constructive and professional way in which you and the wider equine industry approach the challenges placed before you and for your willingness to share your extensive experience and expertise with us, in particular the British Horse Council throughout last year. As a result, the equine industry was one of the best prepared for our leaving the European Union. A strong example of the close collaboration that will continue as we go into the next stage of our negotiations with the EU. Collaboration is aided by our valued network for advice on policy from the Animal Health and Welfare Board for England, expert scientific advice from the Animal Welfare Committee, and from partnership with stakeholders such as the British Horse Council. Close collaboration across the four nations is also essential, and I'm delighted in having already seen the CVO for Scotland this morning, Dr Sheila Verse, who is going to be on the panel later. I should say, in respect of coronavirus, I know many of you are involved in or host equine events. I can assure everyone here today that we will use whatever necessary steps are available and that any decisions made will be based on the best available scientific evidence and indeed the recommendations of our expert bodies. Turning to identification and traceability, I think we would all agree an effective central equine database is a critical part of the drive for equine identification and traceability. This is a priority for the government. It is encouraging for us all that our approach on equine ID is indeed being considered by other countries. We have a robust database, but for the system to be fully effective, the information in it needs to be correct. I'm sorry to say at the moment, it is far from perfect. Indeed, less than one in 10 of horses' records are fully correct. The main reason for this is a failure on the part of many owners historically to alert their PIOs to changes in their or their horses' circumstances. These errors really must be corrected and fast. If not, we threaten both human health and equine traceability and biosecurity. But equally, the right information supports equine welfare providing a more reliable picture of horse ownership and helping identify owners of strays or abandoned animals. I also expect PIOs to fulfil their own legal obligations and responsibilities to action the various and necessary changes in the records in a timely fashion. From the 1st of October this year, this marks the deadline for the completion of microchipping for horses born before 2009 to ensure we transition to universal horse microchipping. Let us be clear why we're doing this, and I emphasise this. We're doing this to enhance horse welfare and ensuring these wonderful animals receive the care they deserve. We will impress on current owners both the legal requirements they must meet and the wider importance of updating their CED records. They will be able to do so as normal through their PIOs. However, 
With the assistance of the PIOs, we will also be allowing owners to do this themselves through the CD Digital Stable for free. My speech says underline for free, by the way. <laughs> we are opening up the stable to all current owners precisely with this in mind. There will be ID validation and changes of horse ownership will go through rigorous screening as part of this process. I have to say, I was, when I arrived, I was taken to one side for a demonstration of this with the chief executive of the equine register and the BHS. Uh, I'm pleased to say that it worked perfectly. I did then inquire whether they'd had a dummy run at this. They looked at me very annoyed, thinking I could have even thought of it. But it did work extremely well, and I do want to emphasize that we are seeking to make matters straightforward and proportionate, but I do want to emphasize it is extremely important we get as horse owners down to this. The government will be conducting a targeted communications campaign very soon to make sure everyone understands their legal obligations to microchip, but also to notify their PIOs of any changes promptly. The government has provided what we believe is an effective core system for identification and traceability. But it is essential, and I know everyone in this room and beyond agrees with this in principle. We need now, now to put this into practice. It is essential the whole of the equine sector now fully collaborate with these communications on obligations of horse owners. Turning to the welfare of racehorses, the government very much welcomed the creation last year of the Racing Industries Horse Welfare Board. I want to acknowledge Nick Rust's leadership in this area and wish him well as he stands down from the BHA at the end of this year. Last month, the board launched its strategy to safeguard horse welfare, and I welcome the work to improve further lifetime traceability. You will be hearing from its independent chairman, Barry Johnston, Johnson, later. The analysis shows a long-term fall in the number of racehorse fatalities. This is clearly very good news and a real step in the right direction. But it is the case that the government believes more can be done and industry agrees. The government welcomes this strategy and will work with industry in the support of these ambitions. I also want to recognise the valuable work that organisations like the National Equine Welfare Council and its members do in equine rescue, rehoming and wider education. We are exploring the potential impacts of licensing animal rescue and rehoming organisations. And I'm particularly grateful for the support of the World Horse Welfare, the Horse Trust and Red Wings amongst others in their support. I also thank those welfare charities that help to tackle cases of poor welfare and irresponsible tethering. The government considers the best way to tackle these issues is through prevention, working in partnership with stakeholders to promote and educate on good practice and responsible tethering. As Minister for Biosecurity I, and Rural Affairs, I'm about to take the Agriculture Bill through the House of Lords. I believe this bill presents opportunities. The Agri Agriculture Bill is a pathway for developing higher health and welfare standards for farm animals, for instance. The equine industry, with veterinary input, should consider, I believe, a similar initiative in partnership with others, such as the APHA and, I believe, the Animal Health Trust. I know it can be a challenge to find safe and attractive places to ride. Access to the natural environment has been identified as a key public good in the new environmental land management system, which will replace direct payments in a transition. Options being considered as part of the environmental land management include the creation of new pathways such as bridleways. I think with Harmony, and I urge the British Horse Society and others to partner with landowners and farmers in the development of this. I should also say my officials have recently made contact with the Dartmoor Commoners Council and pony keepers there to resolve the ongoing challenges around the sale of ponies on moors. 
but the Agriculture Bill can also support native equine breeds on those moors and elsewhere. I support the UK's growing leadership in animal health, improving our outbreak resilience for exotic disease such as EVA, for endemic disease such as equine flu, and I emphasise protecting our international borders. So we're all about to hear from Richard Newton why such high standards are needed. I believe, and in saying this, I know this is something that we all so strongly believe, the care and protection of equines is undoubtedly a privilege and a responsibility. Government is responsible in some areas, but there are so many things we can all do and do better, individually and collectively, to maintain the preeminent status of equines in our society. So working in partnership will allow others in the future to have the same opportunities to enjoy the company and pleasure of the horse as indeed all of us have and do. Events like this one, I've always felt when I was there and having been here for four times, provides, I think, that impetus. And so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be part of this. But I do want to thank everyone because I think one of the greatest charges we have is to champion that great animal, the horse. <laughs>